All right, thank you all for coming today to this uh, uh, segment of Chicago's Best Ideas. This segment is unique because it's not actually Chicago's Best Ideas, it's uh, Tunisia's Best Ideas, and I'll explain exactly why that is the case. Um, I'm talking today about an international court for constitutional law, and this is an idea that originated with a man named Monsef Marzouki, who was a doctor and a dissident in Tunisia for many years, uh, fighting the Ben Ali regime, which was in power for about 30 years. And this uh, dissident, at one point, formed a political party. His constant call during his years of dissent was for the government to simply obey the law as it was written in the Constitution and the National Law Codes. That's all he wanted. Um, but of course, it was a dictatorship, and a particularly corrupt dictatorship at that. And so they didn't, they didn't do very much of that. Uh, when he formed a political party in 2002, they banned the party, even though there was a constitutional right to form parties. And he went off to exile in France, and then began to call for not international intervention or anything like that, but simply some mechanism to enforce the Tunisian constitution. Now, of course, this couldn't be done in Tunisia because it was a dictatorship, and the dictator controlled the courts. Um, but his idea has uh, gained new force since he was elected president of the country. That helps, of course, to advance your ideas. And he's proposed this idea at the United Nations. He's going to continue to push it uh, this fall. Um, and uh, among other things, has uh, set up a little commission. He invited me to serve on this commission to try to prepare the groundwork for this idea. So I thought I would spend the time today talking about um, this idea and evaluate it in a neutral way uh, to, to decide whether it's something or to see what the, what the possibilities and constraints are for an idea um, as radical, really, as an international court for constitutional law. In some sense, um, the project faces three big conceptual difficulties, right? The first is, of course, that the Constitution is supposed to be the highest law of the land. It is a law created by we, the people, for ourselves, an expression of our fundamental values and our deepest um, beliefs. It is a device for self-government. It's not a device for international government. And um, so this is something that is a kind of challenge just in terms of thinking about what constitutions are. This challenge, I think, can be overcome, as I will explain. A second conceptual challenge is the idea that uh, constitutions are best interpreted at the local level. We have seen in recent years a wave of constitutional courts be established in many countries all over the world, and these, the job of these courts is to interpret the Constitution. And so the second conceptual difficulty is that those are the only body that should do so. This difficulty, too, I think can be overcome. I'll explain that, in fact, um, constitutional interpretation happens rather routinely outside the national boundaries. That is, outsiders routinely uh, interpret constitutions um, whether or not the country or the government concerned wants them to do so. So I think that can be overcome. The third challenge is the most significant, though, and that is the question of whether this external body that we're talking about ought to be at the international level. That is, whether it ought to be a sort of single body for the whole world or not. And this touches on many contemporary debates in international law, including the idea about whether there is an international right to democracy. Uh, which is a, a very large debate in the international legal sphere. And this, I think, is a greater challenge. So I will go through the, each of these um, in turn. So first, the idea that um, constitutions are exclusively local products. Well, if you think about the earliest written constitutions, we know, of course, they were expressions of we the people. But they were also designed to communicate on an international sphere. Right? Constitutions from the very beginning have been about uh, designating a national government so that other countries can deal with it. And that was, of course, the, a major objective of our founding fathers, trying to come up with a vehicle for international relations in the wake of the rather failed Articles of Confederation. The Constitution itself says lots of things about foreign affairs. Uh, who's the commander-in-chief? Who is the representative in terms of foreign affairs? And, of course, the crucial question of how treaties are made, how international commitments can be made that other states can rely upon. So that's a really important international function. But beyond this uh, rather basic point, inter uh, constitutions around the world have always, and increasingly, are produced in a kind of a transnational process. They're not exclusively local documents. Now, this point is most apparent if you think about the cases of foreign military occupation. 
So, after World War II, when the United States occupied Japan, um, the Japanese began to draft a constitution of their own. The draft leaked to the press, the local press, and uh, MacArthur heard about it, and he and many Japanese citizens were very unhappy with the draft. It was a very conservative draft. So Douglas MacArthur, in his wisdom, jotted down on a piece of paper four basic principles, handed it to his assistant, and said, go draft a constitution for Japan, which the assistant and about 20 other Americans did in about 10 days. They kept this secret for many years, but basically, um, you know, if you read the Constitution of Japan, it's full of all these phrases which make no sense in Japanese but make a lot of sense in English. Um, you know, <laughs> rights are the fruit of man's age-old struggle to be free, things like this, which, uh, which read well in English and the Americans insisted on putting in there. Um, in any case, that's an extreme case of a foreign drafting of the Constitution. We've also seen, more recently, cases like Iraq and Afghanistan where uh, the draft is produced by a local team, but under, with heavy support from international actors. And to some degree, uh, the choices that the local drafters can make are bounded by the fact that there's a foreign force uh, that's keeping security. Beyond that, um, colonial countries, uh, countries that became, got independence, let's say, from the United Kingdom, typically, in order to do that, had to negotiate with the British Foreign Office about their own constitution. And the document was typically produced in a kind of joint uh, meeting with local political leaders, meeting with colonial lawyers, colonial office lawyers, to draft the text. And so a lot of these texts, at least the first constitutions of many ex-British colonies, look very similar because they were drafted by a similar group of lawyers in the colonial office. So that's a kind of source of international influence, if you will, on constitutional text. More broadly, there's a large category of um, instances in which foreigners show up and advise the local drafters on what they're doing. This too is of ancient origin. Uh, the great uh, French philosopher Rousseau himself went to Poland and went to Corsica to draft constitutions for these local uh, countries. Unfortunately, Corsica was invaded by the French before he could finish the job, but he uh, in any case was going to be the foreign father, if you will, of the constitution. More recently, in any recent constitution-making exercise, uh, say that of the world's most newest country, that of South Sudan, you have a whole plethora of international organizations that are supporting the constitution-making process, providing input on drafts, and sometimes, in some countries, actually having foreigners who sit on the drafting commission. So the point is that what, you, what the documents being produced are not simply expressions of what we, the people of S Somalia, South Sudan, you know, Kenya, Kyrgyzstan, you name it, want, it's what we, the people, um, can say in collaboration with some foreign sort of technocrats who kind of advise and constrain what is actually going to be said. So the point is that constitutions are not simply local documents, and therefore it's not necessarily crazy to think that foreigners might have something to say about the interpretation of the document. Second challenge, uh, should interpretation be exclusively local? Well, again, this is something which, if you think about it, is not uh, really has probably never been the case, but increasingly is something which uh, we find a lot of interpretation of constitutional texts outside the borders of the state. Another example from ex-British colonies is um, the countries that, after becoming independent, retained the jurisdiction of something called the Privy Council, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. What's the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council? It's a bunch of judges sitting in London who were, in fact, the United Kingdom Supreme Court. They sat as the House of Lords, which you may have heard of. Um, but for disputes that arose outside of the United Kingdom, they were the highest court of appeal. So that um, in a country, let's say, like Jamaica, you know, you would, uh, if you had a problem with the, the local constitution, you would appeal all the way to the Jamaican Supreme Court. And then if you didn't like their decision, you could say they got it wrong. You could appeal outside the borders of the state back to London. And this was a, probably a good thing from the point of view of the new creators of these constitutions. After all, every constitution maker faces a fundamental problem of credibility. How is anyone to believe the promises that I make on a piece of paper? In order to make promises credible, you need some institution to guarantee them. And the problem with a, a exclusively local institutions, they can always be captured, right? You can always influence the judges to, influence the judges to give an interpretation that you like, and we see this all over the world. By tying their own hands, the new countries, the new ex-colonies, 
um, by limiting their own power to manipulate the judges who would interpret the Constitution, they might have actually, in some sense, empowered themselves, right? Because they would, um, their promises suddenly became believable when they would not otherwise be. And this might have helped local people, you know, local capital, for example, uh, stay around and not, not simply flee the country. It might help induce foreign investment. And it might indeed add uh, protection for human rights. I should say that uh, in recent years, this jurisdiction has been declining. Uh, very severely. Many countries are leaving this, and maybe it's because they no longer need an international mechanism for credibility. But for present purposes, it's an important example of sort of international constitutional interpretation and shows in some sense how that can function to help local constitution makers make their promises more believable. Um, regional organizations often have a role in interpreting national constitutions. I'll give some examples. In, in recent years, um, there's been the kind of consolidation of um, an organization called the Economic Committee for, uh, uh, um, Commission of West African States. It's 15 West African states. They were trying to form a free market. Uh, and it turned out that the free, they set up a court to, uh, to adjudicate disputes related to the free market. It's actually had very few cases. They've had a much more important jurisdiction in human rights. Uh, but for present purposes, it's not necessarily the court I want to talk about. It's the organization. West Africa, as anyone who follows the news knows, is a pretty unstable region. There are frequent coups, civil wars, many other things. Um, but sometimes what will happen in this region now is that after an unconstitutional change in government, the organization will get together and decide to suspend the membership of the country in question. They've done this for Guinea-Bissau, they've done it for the Ivory Coast, Mali, and most recently, uh, or not, not most recently, but uh, earlier in Niger. Let me give an example of how it works. In Niger, um, in 2009, the president was a man named Mamadou Tanja. He himself had been elected 10 years before. He was seen as a great democratic hope. He had been an opposition leader. And as often happens in Africa and many other parts of the world, the opposition leader, once they show up in the president's office, decides it's a pretty comfortable place. Uh, and, you know, well, even though the Constitution limited me to 10 years, the people really do want me to stay. I mean, you know, I just can't help it. I've got to accede to popular demands and find a way to stay on. So Tanja proposed this, proposed a referendum on this topic, whether the Constitution should uh, be replaced so that he could stay in power. And, um, but that, unfortunately, was illegal according to the terms of the Constitution. That was not a possible subject for referendum. So the dispute went to the local constitutional court, which ruled against the president. He responded by suspending the legislature and ruling by decree, uh, running a sham referendum you know, very quickly, and managing to secure a new mandate. Well, this is a case where there's obviously a, the best, most charitable description is that there is a local dispute about the meaning of the Constitution. Uh, you know, the, the, the Constitutional Court says one thing, and uh, the President says another. You know, the Constitutional Court doesn't always need to be final, right? There's a lot of debate in American constitutional scholarship about how the court is not actually uh, final, and there's a kind of dialogues that happen among multiple actors. So the most charitable description for the dictator, or for Tanja, was that, uh, that he just had a different interpretation. The thing, then, is that uh, the international organization, the regional organization, then had to make a determination, and they decided after looking at all the circumstances, that he had violated the Constitution, and they suspended the membership. Now, he didn't last very long. There was a coup a few months after that, uh, and they remained suspended because of that. Uh, but the point is that regional organizations, by virtue of controlling their own membership, um, engage in a kind of constant monitoring about not just sort of the state of democracy, but the state of constitutional um, um, yeah, the state of the Constitution in any given country, right? Because they um, will typically guard against unconstitutional changes in power. More broadly, any time um, an international actor must respond to a change in government, they're engaged in some sense in a kind of implicit or explicit interpretive act. Are we going to recognize this government or not? That's easy enough when the change is through an election, but if there's anything fuzzy, uh, in some sense every other state has a decision to make about what the local constitutional order required in terms of the change of power. So it's a kind of ubiquitous and necessary function. Um, a couple other examples. In, um, the La in Latin America, of course, there's, a, there's an organization called the Organization of American States. Uh, 
Uh, and in recent years, they had a number of fights with the government of Hugo Chavez, um, who rest in peace. Um, after he took power in 1999, he uh, set up a commission to restructure the judiciary, uh, which meant, of course, that he could hi hire and fire judges at will. He's trying to replace the judiciary with people um, who were more amenable to his um, Bolivarian revolution. The terms, the text of the Constitution says this commission will be in existence for a year. Ten years later, it was still in existence. I think it's still in existence today. Um, and so the Organization of American States through the Inter-American uh, Court were faced with this question, well, what is, what is going on here? And what they said is that you are not following your own constitution. Again, it's a kind of regional solution. And um, this is just one of many examples of their engagement. Of course, it doesn't have to be a regional body. One other example I'd like to give is um, that of Afghanistan. So the Afghan constitution was uh, adopted in very early 2004. Um, and in 2009, the first term of President Hamid Karzai was coming up, and there was going to be an election. Um, and the Constitution seemed to require an election date, uh, which uh, pretty clearly uh, required an election, uh, didn't require an election date, it set a date by which he had to step down. He proposed to have an election then, very early. The problem was Afghanistan was not at all a secure place. How do you have an election in a country where the government controls 40% of the territory. What is that election going to mean? The United States and the Afghan Local Election Commission said that the set an election date, um, or said that there should be an election date, which was a little bit later, to allow the security situation to improve. This turned into a giant constitutional dispute between Karzai on the one hand, who maybe for the first and only time in his life uh, thought the text of the Constitution was really important, um, and the Election Commission, on the other hand, the United States, again, was in this position of having to decide between two domestic interpretations, sided with the Election Commission. Again, I'm just, my point is that this is a kind of routine thing. The problem is, of course, that if external actors have to interpret local constitutions, there's a possibility that they might disagree, right, on what the local constitution requires in any particular case. Um, and this, I think, uh, is illustrated by a, a case in 2009 in um, Honduras. So in Honduras, the president was in a similar situation to my example from Niger. Uh, the Constitution had term limited the, the president to one term, a five-year term. The Constitution, in addition to prevent any manipulation of that, said that anyone who even proposes a change in the term limit immediately loses office pretty good kind of poison pill type of mechanism. Well, uh, Manuel Zelaya, an ally of Hugo Chavez, decided that it would be a good thing to, um, to try to stay on, and maybe the people demanded it and such. Um, and so he proposed that there be a referendum on whether to adopt a new constitution. The Supreme Court of the country said that that was a violation, and they issued an arrest warrant for him. So far, so good. That's where things, th this is where things get a little fuzzy. Instead of having the police come and have a trial in Honduras, the military came, took him in his pajamas, and sent him out of the country on a plane. And uh, this led to a, a very big debate as to what exactly had happened. Immediately after that, the line of succession was followed, right? So the Speaker of the House, who is supposed to take power if the President can't serve in office, became the President. The military never took power. But the Organization of American States characterized it as a coup, a coup d'etat, because the military had removed the President physically. Is that a coup d'etat or not? Depends on your definition. Is it an unconstitutional change in government? Well, it depends on how you view the Supreme Court, which was a pretty partisan body, uh, and this mechanism of military removal. There was a dispute. The United States initially said there was not a coup. Um, and later, later actors or later uh, commissions sort of came to the agreement that both parties were in the wrong. The point is that there was a lot of disagreement among international actors. and that might provide a rationale for having an international body. Um, the basic problem is one that we see all the time in international relations. We need, if we're you know, a community of states that are trying to react to a situation, it might be helpful to coordinate our understanding as to what happened. Why? So we can coordinate our, our punishment or our acceptance of what happened. Um, and that would be, I think, a useful function for an international court of constitutional law. Um, there are, however, a number of problems with the proposal. Um, 
And I suppose the first one is um, that states, in reacting to situations like, say, Honduras, might prefer to have the flexibility to react differently in different situations. It might be the United States didn't want to call this a coup because they didn't like Zelaya, the president, because he was an ally of Hugo Chavez. Politics may have been determining the reaction. And if that is the case, then you're going to see states being very reluctant to give up some power to uh, nine unelected international judges to make decisions like this. So that seems to be a pretty big challenge. Um, furthermore, um, there's likely to be a kind of, uh, uh, at least a potential for a kind of um, undermining of the regional mechanisms which I described, which seem to be working pretty well. In many regions of the world, you have regional organizations which act as sort of local cops, if you will, to prevent un, uh, constitutional changes in government. And at least in some parts of the world, that seems to be working. Of course, the problem is they don't exist everywhere, right? There are large parts of the world which don't have such a regional organization. East Asia, pretty important part of the world. Uh, the Middle East outside of Africa. And so an international body might, you know, be able to cover those regions which aren't currently protected. On the other hand, if you have an international body, it might undermine these pretty effective bodies. It might, it might crowd them out um, of, of the enforcement that they're already engaged in. Um, another issue related to this is what law it would enforce. And this gets to the large debate about whether there is indeed an international right to democracy. To briefly summarize, a, a professor at NYU a couple decades ago um, sort of surveyed many international documents said, you know, there is an international right to democracy. Every person on earth has a right to be governed by a democratic government. Um, it was kind of a radical proposition. It sounds good at first, except when you realize that, you know, the international environment is made up of lots of different kinds of states, uh, which many of which are not, demo are not democracies, right? And so you're essentially saying that we have to have a regime change in half the states of the world. Now that is going to lead to a kind of interventionist foreign policy, maybe a, a policy which would generate much more uh, conflict than one which accepts the kind of pluralist basis of international society, recognizes that many different kinds of states with many different kinds of local legitimacy exist. And so there's been a large debate about it. I myself am a little skeptical that there's an international right to democracy, as you might guess, but there are some people who advocate that it indeed uh, does exist and should exist. But, um, Whatever the state of it, I don't think it's possible to claim that it, it does exist as an effective right at this point. And that leads to the question as to what, what, uh, what this court would enforce were it able to do so. I think there are another, another number of um, quite practical challenges in the creation of the International Court for Constitutional Law, and some of them have to do with politics. And it might be good just uh, for comparison to think about the other great international court that's been created in recent years, the International Criminal Court, right? Now, when the International Criminal Court was first proposed, uh, and uh, it really in the early 90s, I suppose, is when it began to really take, uh, to take steam, everyone thought it was a complete fantasy. And yet today, it's sitting in The Hague, it has a number of cases, it's got a big budget, it's operating. I mean, that suggests that we shouldn't just throw this idea out of hand. There may be some way or some sort of political alignment in which um, the International Court for Constitutional Law might follow a similar pattern. But in thinking about the probability of that, I think we have to look at the politics of the International Criminal Court. So recall, the International Criminal Court really took steam in the wake of two massive genocides in which the West did nothing, right? And that's, of course, Bosnia, uh, the former Yugoslavia, and uh, Rwanda. And uh, the embarrassment factor for Western governments was pretty severe, right? How can we, after 50 years of the development of human rights in the United Nations system and declaration of uh, commitment to preventing uh, human rights violations, how can governments just stand by when genocide is occurring? So governments not actually wanting to go and prevent genocide uh, decided that at least they could adjudicate these things afterwards, and that might have a kind of deterrent effect. The politics of it involved um, a large group of countries that are allied together. Many of those are places like Norway and Denmark and Australia, countries where genocide is never, ever going to occur. So for them, this was a very easy decision. They can take the moral high ground with no risk that this body is going to really infringe on their own sovereignty. 
Uh, there are also countries that are very weak and unstable, the kind of countries where serious human rights violations do occur, civil war, genocide, etc. For those countries, this court was also desirable. Why? Because it meant that there might be some help for them in trying to enforce and prevent these horrific uh, kinds of events. So that was a kind of natural alliance which emerged. Of course, famously, the United States stayed out of it after negotiating um, uh, quite a bit about the treaty, but, and that's because we were afraid of, or our military was afraid that they would be subject to its jurisdiction. Uh, but setting that aside, you had a coalition. Now, if we're talking about an international right to democracy, what is that going to entail? What is that going to embody? We in the United States have many problems with our own democracy, right? Many problems. Would it entail uh, international review of Bush v. Gore? Would it entail an international adjudication requiring national uniformity in ballot boxes? It's hard to know. Democracy is something which countries differ about what its content requires. In the United States, we uh, think freedom of speech is absolutely essential and should be more or less absolute. In Europe, uh, absolute freedom of speech is seen as the threat to democracy because of hate speech and things like this. You need to protect against that kind of thing. Uh, there's different interpretations as to what it would actually require. Um, gun control, right? For most countries in the world, the idea that democracy would be benefited you know, by everyone having a gun seems crazy. But there are many Americans who think it is. That is the essence of democracy because it allows citizen resistance against the government. And whatever your views on it, the point is that people disagree. Wearing a hijab uh, or you know, a full face covering, which is now illegal in several European countries and there are proposals in more. Well, in the United States, we tend to think that's a ridiculous law. That's an undemocratic law. It interferes with democracy. In Europe, they think it's pro-democracy. The point is that we disagree. And so how, what is this court going to do that's going to um, um, help this coalition to form? Because I don't think Norway and the United States and Australia are going to be very happy with international adjudication of democracy if it's going to affect them and us. And you could say that's wrong. Uh, in my opinion, the court should focus only on uh, a narrow category of things which form actual threats to the continuation of democracy. It is very unlikely in the United States that we are going to be subject to a coup d'etat. Uh, it's very unlikely we are going to get an unconstitutional usurpation of power and, ex and um, overturning of the um, constitutional prohibition on more than two terms, this kind of thing. So you could imagine a small set of norms which would be articulated in a treaty for which international adjudication might work, and it would be those things which were most uh, threatening to fragile democracies, new democracies, rather than old established ones. To continue, um, in terms of the prospects for this, there are more lessons, I think, from the International Criminal Court. And by, but, the, but, but the point about narrow set of law was part of it, right? The International Criminal Court really focuses on you know, four categories of very severe international crime, which everyone thinks are outrageous. Uh, the fourth one, aggression, there's a lot more dispute about, and that one um, has been a little more difficult to define. But uh, so limiting the jurisdiction would be helpful. Another lesson of the International Criminal Court is the role of civil society. I don't think this can just be a project of states. The International Criminal Court was produced with overwhelming support from the states of the world, largely because civil society, non-governmental organizations got behind it and lobbied their own governments or embarrassed their own governments into participating. At the Rome Conference in 1998, when the court was finally produced, uh, the Rome Statute was finally produced, um, some 200 non-governmental organizations were present and lobbying and helping to support um, the countries that were trying to put the thing together as well as the United Nations. So that kind of alliance, I think, would be very important as well. Um, but all this said, there is likely to be um, um, some severe problems. And, and, and I think one of the questions is one that is prompted, in some sense, by my, um, by my suggestion that an international court might review Bush v. Gore. What if that had happened? Well, if they had overturned Bush v. Gore, I guarantee you 50% of the United States would be happy and 50% would be very unhappy, right? It wouldn't actually help to resolve the fundamental you know, cleavage in the society. Uh, and in some sense, having international actors engage in these things can generate a backlash. You know, a very good example, again, from the International Criminal Court, it concerns Kenya 
In Kenya, there was uh, post-election violence a few years ago, and uh, the International Criminal Court was called in, and they indicted uh, a number of Kenyan leaders, two of whom have just won the presidency and vice presidency of Kenya. And people there tell me that this would not have happened had they not been indicted by the International Criminal Court. That is, the International Criminal Court, uh, you know, indicting Uhuru Kenyatta, uh, may have led his supporters to be more vigorous in pushing him forward. So that's a very interesting uh, point, and it suggests that these kind of international interventions can have uh, unintended consequences and might have to be taken very carefully. Um, well, I've uh, spoken for quite a while. Um, I will just conclude by saying that this proposal does seem to be uh, going forward. The Tunisians are pushing it, and uh, it remains to be seen how far it will go. Um, there has been a lot of work in terms of developing the details, the institutional details of the court. I can talk a little bit about that in the uh, question and answer if you're interested. Um, but I think uh, ultimately this question of how deep the court is going to be is going to be a really important one. Basically, in international institutional design, there is a trade-off between depth and breadth. The deeper you intervene into local and national processes, the fewer countries are going to join. The shallower you intervene, the broader. The International Criminal Court is actually a pretty shallow intervention. It just means don't, you know, it basically says don't commit genocide, don't harbor people who've done it. Well, that doesn't require too much of states. Uh, you know, a much deeper say, thing like, say, the European Union treaties are, you know, face a real challenge or trade-off between breadth and depth. Uh, and I expect that this one would as well. And so my recommendation to the, those who are pursuing this uh, is to focus not on depth, but on breadth and on forming a political coalition which might make this, uh, this dream turn into a reality. Thank you very much. So I have a little time for questions, if there are any, or comments. Yeah, in the back. Given the United States' aversion to giving up authority to international uh, tribunals or organizations, do you expect that it would be likely for us to join no, I expect uh, that we, we would be sort of last, uh, last power to ever do so. I mean, imagine a proposal, I don't know, in the Senate today. Uh, how many senatorial votes would that get? Maybe one, maybe two. Uh, but the point is that the International Criminal Court is really the beginning of an era which shows us the United States doesn't matter that much in terms of these institutions. And the regional, the, eff the efficacy of the regional bodies in terms of policing democracy at a kind of local level um, suggests that that's not an insurmountable obstacle. So um, I think it's a good question, but I don't think it's likely that uh, we'd be joining anytime soon. Yeah, Helen. I have a question about the implications for this kind of institution, for the development of institutions within the state. Yeah. So because you're delegating, a, to the extent that a constitution is a constituting document of the state, and you're saying that this would, I mean, your work recognizes the constitution that and constitutions fail. To what extent are you not giving the helping states the right to develop in their own way and to develop their own constitutions in their own way? Even if you're very narrow and saying we're just going to prevent these kind of coups. I mean, my country there was a coup and it led to a democratic government. Right. And so why, why, don't, why aren't we handicapping them mm -hmm. by creating this body outside that determines whether or not we do that? Right. It's a really good question. So sometimes international institutions can um, complement local, you know, push for democracy in this case, but sometimes they can substitute for it. That is, they can crowd it out and, uh, and, and make it more difficult for locals to organize. And that's in some sense the backlash story that I was telling with uh, Kenyatta in Kenya. Um, yeah, um, you know, is, is Kenya better off without him? I don't want to get into the politics of, uh, of, of, of that. Uh, but the point is that, you, that the outside intervention may not have been complementary as it was intended to be. Um, it's hard to know, though, because you have to kind of take both sides of the ledger into account. To the extent an institution like this has some deterrence value, we're unlikely to observe uh, you know, many challenges to democracy. How many presidents decide not to seek a third term uh, because of the fear of international enforcement? Typically, what you'll have when a new institution like this is, in, is established is a kind of a transition period where you, you have some instances of backlash and such, but eventually, if the regime stabilizes properly, then um, you can imagine it could play a kind of a supplemental role.
Um, well, what about from a re uh, realist point of view? You know, um, if there if there's a re region with say a dominant superpower uh, in the region or a dominant country in the region, uh, the uh, problem of that country through the, you know uh, uh, through the court affecting uh, the uh, politics of its neighbors, so to speak. Right. So um, yes, there's a fear of of moral hazard with external intervention where you know you just intervene in the cases with people you don't like uh, or you might have some kind of selfish motive and of course we do observe that uh, very frequently I think that's one reason that this proposal is for a court right courts are standing bodies their appointments are through some you know very transparent mechanism and the thought is that uh, as an international court it might be more immune if you will from purely partisan um, uh, pressure or the current situation which is that countries intervene when it's in their interest, right? Um, this is a big issue when it comes to the idea of humanitarian intervention, right? Humanitarian intervention is, a, is the idea that a state can intervene when there's severe human rights violations. And one of the great parts of the debate is, oh, if we allow this doctrine to exist, there's going to be a lot of interventions. There's going to be a kind of moral hazard problem. I'm not sh I think that problem may be overrated. You know, it's still costly to have a, a humanitarian intervention, but it is a concern whenever you have an international court. Um, yeah. If constitutions have relatively short lifespans, would every constitution have to be automatic? Would it be automatically opted in each successive constitution and regime in a state? Yes. Yeah, so the, there's a kind of technical international law question of how you create an institution like this. Uh, one possibility, of course, would be to have a constitutional amendment, or when drafting a new constitution, to just put in there like the post-colonial constitutions that had jurisdiction to the Privy Council, uh, a clause which says, you know, disputes about meaning of the Constitution on X and Y topics can be appealed to this international court. That would be one way to do it. The other way, of course, and I think that's the way that they're proceeding, is to adopt an actual international treaty. And that would involve states signing a treaty. And, um, you know, of course, it depends on whether it's a kind of, in international law terms, a monist or a dualist state. But the basic notion is that once you sign the treaty, it doesn't matter what happens constitutionally. Constitutions come and go, governments come and go, the treaty binds the country. And so it will endure, notwithstanding various domestic changes in power. So that seems to be um, the way things are going. Going off of your comment on the, the breadth and depth, um, excuse me, would you expect to see a significant amount of variation uh, for a court like this regarding the internal processes of judicial review within a state? Um, so state A has a certain process for reviewing constitutional matters and state B has a different one. Would the court's interaction vary based on domestic policies or would it, the sort of treaty aspect supersede that? Well, again, I mean, it obviously depends on the details of the institutional design, but I think that's exactly the kind of thing you'd want to avoid, right? That you, you know, and it gets to the question before about whether or not we're going to, um, we need to empower local constitutional courts. We need to make sure that they're institutionally strong. So displacing them and allowing people to appeal any decision up to some international level tends to make these national constitutional courts less important, less valued. Um, and that seems to me a, a real downside of the proposal. And again, a reason for just restricting it to the small number of cases or issues on which you expect that capture is likely to be a particular concern. I should say that in designing constitutional courts in recent years, because of the spread of judicial review and the the popularity of it, and the, really the success of many constitutional courts in adjudicating difficult disputes. There's been a tendency to increasingly assign new powers to them. Uh, you know, a power, for example, to decide election disputes, or a power to declare political parties unconstitutional, um, and, and things like this. Um, in some cases, even the power to propose legislation. And in my view, this is also a kind of danger. Overloading an institution that seems to be performing well, it's a common problem in the development literature. You have an institution that's doing well, all of a sudden you give it a bunch of new tasks and then can't do its original task very well. So that's a danger too. Uh, but basically you're getting at the substitution point. I think that's, that's a, definitely a very valid concern. Do you think that the conception you just elaborated is only workable in developing countries or less developed countries? Because I mean, actually, I guess even Democrats would not be happy to see Bush Miss score reviewed by, let's say, Chinese government or... So, uh, I'm wondering whether it is only workable in, to be very honest, in less developed countries. Well, that might be right, that countries that... Uh, but it, again, it, 
think back to my example of the Privy Council, right? That was a decision that was taken perhaps with some pressure from the British, right? On, let's say, the Jamaicans or the citizens of Barbados or whatever. But, you know, it did serve a local function. And I think it could be a particularly useful thing during a period when a new democracy is just coming into being, during a period of democratization, it might help to make those promises more credible. That might suggest, actually, that the form of this thing should take into account the possibility that it's simply a temporary jurisdiction, that it's something that you would opt into by treaty for a period of X years, just to guard against very particular kinds of problems and threats that you think are likely to undermine the local democratic order. Uh, and that might be a good addendum to the institutional design. It's not what's being thought of now. Um, the basic institutional design that's contemplated is really copying the way that the International Criminal Court was created. So that involves um, delegating a body called the International Law Commission, which is a body of the United Nations which drafts large multilateral treaties, with the task of coming up with a draft, uh, model draft design, uh, which would then serve as the basis of a, um, a kind of statute like the Rome Statute, which would be adopted by many countries in the form of a treaty. So that's the way they're going about it. But it's not the only way that one could. You could imagine some soft law type mechanisms or some other alternative designs which might be more effective. But I think you've, you've touched on the, the, the temporal aspect and the idea that maybe it, uh, it's not something that established democracies really are going to want. Yeah. So my concern, maybe you already responded to it and I just missed it, but so fundamentally, or at least my understanding again is that this is kind of, a, it's helping a lot of developing countries um, who are, maybe it won't just be developing countries, but it seems like those are going to be the ones that are, you know, trying to essentially bolster their institutions. Um, and thus they already kind of have these rule of law issues. They if they, if they're, they're already probably going to have some rule of law issues if they need this independent body. And thus if they're not even willing to abide by their own rule of law for a thing like, you know, uh, overstaying your terms of office, why would they be willing to listen to an international institution to tell them to do Right. So um, we have an example from this regional experience, right, that it's actually costly to be kicked out of a regional institution uh, in a number of different ways, right? So when you were kicked out of the, the West African community, well, there's actually trade benefits you lose. So that's really concrete. Um, if you're kicked out of the international or the Organization of American States, it's maybe less uh, economic, but more a kind of embarrassment factor. The British Commonwealth, I should add, also plays this kind of role. Uh, it's kind of a club of ex-British colonies, and they show up and advise you on democracy and law and such. And, uh, but I think there is something that, uh, to being sanctioned at this international level. It means you're called out. So even, um, you know, it's not going to be a perfect corrective, right? It's not going to be a perfect mechanism that's going to deter uh, people who want to stay in power. Being a dictator is a pretty good job, right? A pretty valuable one, though it often ends badly. Uh, but you can at least exploit some money, uh, exploit the, uh, the country for a little while and do pretty well um, temporarily. Um, now, how else might enforcement work if it's not just kicking you out of a club? Uh, well, I do, it's, it's, it's difficult. There's, there's nothing in the statute which contemplates any particular sanction. I think what is uh, being called on in some sense is, um, well, really what the default mechanism of enforcing international law is, which is nothing, right? That is. There's no, uh, you know, barring exceptional cases like threats to peace and security, international peace and security, where the Security Council can mobilize. Um, the general mode of international law is not, not to provide sanctions so much, in my view, as to declare one side or the other being right or wrong, which allows, which does, it's not worthless by any means. What it does, it allows private, uh, private parties or individual states to coordinate their own reaction uh, to what the situation is. So, you know, if, if all the countries in the world condemn a particular country, well, then they have an incentive to coordinate their enforcement behavior, which would be very decentralized. General feature of international law is that enforcement is decentralized. This can, having a court to declare an action as either, you know, kosher or not, if you pardon the expression, can help states to effectuate decentralized uh, enforcement. Oh, I'm sorry. Where is it? Go ahead. I, well, you can just sort of clarify. Oh. Do you consider this an alternative or a supplement to uh, the Security Council and the Commission on UN and the Commission on Human Rights and 
Yes. Um, well, it's a really interesting question to raise the Commission on Human Rights. So, I think um, when we th the people who are talk about a right to democracy tend to root it in a provision in the UN Charter, which is um, which says that the United Nations will promote human rights and fundamental freedoms. Right. So that's some democracy-sounding language in the UN Charter. Notwithstanding the fact that many of the countries were dictatorships, fundamental freedoms, whatever that means, was part of the uh, category. And so the idea is that, well, maybe democracy is such a human right. We have had in the nearly 70 years since uh, the adoption of the UN Charter, um, a large number of different bodies that have been set up to promote and protect human rights within the United Nations and, of course, regional organizations as well. By and large, the lesson of that experience is that the international organizations, the UN organizations, don't function very well at all. They require states to set them up and they require state consent and they tend not to reach very deeply, as you might expect, into um, the concerns of states. Furthermore, they're already set up. So to me, this suggests that thinking about this as a right to democracy within that framework is not helpful. And that indeed, if this court is going to be effective, it should not focus on rights at all. Why? Because as soon as you announce it's going to have a rights jurisdiction, now all of a sudden you have 15 different bodies which are competing with you. We say, no, no, we're the authoritative, the Human Rights Council is the authoritative interpreter of, of human rights, or the European Court is the authoritative interpreter of human rights. Um, that kind of competition wouldn't be good for such a nascent institution. And so I think that uh, probably avoiding rights entirely is a good idea. Um, Hank. So the court seems to be uh, primarily focused on you said a very limited number of issues, essentially, whether a certain regime is going to stay in power or whether they're going to sort of entrench themselves and become dictators. But with the exception of a few regimes and a few countries on the planet, like under the extremes, maybe that are committing genocide or are really part of that regime in South Africa before 1994, most regimes, I mean, that seems to be an inconsequential sort of uh, factor in terms of their development as democracies or as free markets or as economies. Don't you think that like we're just sort of getting involved in a process that seems to be really complex and difficult to understand to begin with, and that might not be a consequential anyway? So you is the question really about democratization and how that happens? And right. I mean, that doesn't seem to be. We don't know if how that relates to develop uh, for the, the for <coughs> economic development or the other way around. Yeah. This might be completely irrelevant. Whether um, you know the the president of Bolivia or whatever got to stay in power or not. Right. I mean, I, I, well, I mean, I'm not so sure. I mean, I do think that, you know, uh, we tend to, th term limits is a pretty interesting institution to talk about in this regard because, of course, you can differ on whether term limits are themselves democratic or undemocratic. With a term limit, you're saying essentially we the people, even if we want to elect someone by a majority in 10 years, we cannot do it. It's a hands-tying mechanism. Uh, and, you know, are term limits democratic, democracy supporting or democracy uh, hindering, but, and there's no consensus on it. There does seem to be a kind of intuition in many new democracies that term limits are really important and that um, they can help, you know, foster long-term democracy. Um, is there an example of that? Of, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Mandela, I think, is a, is a conventional example, right? Mandela probably could still be president today if he wanted, uh, but he stepped down. George Washington, same thing. They kept begging him to keep running. He said, no, I don't want to. And after that, we had a norm, unconstitutional norm, by, I mean, excuse me, unwritten constitutional norm that, um, that presidents wouldn't serve for two, more than two terms. So, you, you, so all that said, we don't really know about what the magic is that creates democracies. We certainly know nothing about timing uh, and you know, really sequencing. And there's, not, there's a lot of work that's been put into that. But I'm not sure we can say very much. And we're continually surprised by people like uh, the Tunisian Mohamed Bouzizi, the guy who uh, immolated himself in late 2010 and sparked the Arab Spring. It would have been impossible to predict that. No one did. Um, so I think you're right to suggest that it's kind of a w poorly understood process, and we don't really know what the effect of an international intervention would be. All that said, you know, there do seem to be things where most people agree a violation of democratic order has occurred. We can, we can make some judgments, I think, about the quality of democracy. But maybe I'm not uh, fully getting the, you know, responding to the question. I, mean, I, would, I would just say, if, let's say the regime in China, if they sort of agreed to this, and then the sort of chairman of the, of the 
comes to try to review a decision, it was appealed, and then the, the constitutional court sort of said, no, you were wrong. And I mean, what, what is the benefit to that if the alternative was just we did nothing, we didn't care about this? China would probably still be developing relatively at a fast pace. I don't know if it would do anything other than create an, another opportunity for violence or some, some sort of instability that in the long run, 10, 20, 30 years, might just be inconsequential in terms of how countries going to develop the economy. I mean, yes, that's true, but you could, but you would tend to think repression is bad regardless of whether it's going to have, you know, midterm consequences that are good, right? I mean, by the logic, you'd say, well, you know, that genocide was really good because, you know, it spurred people to, n to promise never to do it again or something like that. So, um, you know, I do think we can, we can be short term in our assessments, although I think your question also gets at very real concerns that I've raised about backlash and very hard to know how an international intervention would actually play out in the local context. Um, well, it seems like whenever you think this is one model fits all kind of institution, you're always using unstable countries to justify it. But there's a lot of, for instance, Latin America, like developing countries, but where the democracy is actually pretty solid right now, such as Brazil, Chile, and uh, Peru, mm. etc. And uh, in which uh, I think that if the institutions are solid for this type of countries, it's important for the citizens to believe in one of the institutions that we will actually have a final role, work, even if they have the, it's like the, the, the last institution that can make a mistake, like there's no, no recourse after that, because it can then cause more instability, <coughs> because it's like, it's, there's always going to be a small amount of group, a small amount of people that will be dissatisfied with the Supreme Court decision, will try to go to the international court or whatever. Yeah. And, um, but uh, I mean, if, if the Supreme Court can sometimes create divisions within its own country, imagine a foreign body uh, trying to deal with like a multilateral, uh, hundreds and different countries and situations. I'm not sure. I think it's a little more complicated than that. I want to make two points. First of all, you know, the the um, Latin America, of course, one of the the major body is the OAS. One of the reasons they reacted so strongly against the Honduran case was because many of them had had coups, many of them had suffered coups, and democracy was now entrenched enough as a norm for the OAS to take it on and champion it. Well, but in some sense, when they did that, they are an external body, and they're reinforcing the norm in all of their members. They're saying, we you know, are drawing a line here, no military intervention anywhere. So any of you other militaries that are thinking about that, no, you can't do it. And so in some sense, I think the international level can be complementary. Uh, in ways, and we shouldn't just assume that the local or national level is the only level at which uh, democracy reinforcement can happen. Um, the other point you made is about finality. And this is, I think, quite relevant to you know, major debates in American constitutional law. So the traditional view among law professors and judges was that you know, the Supreme Court is final. And this is, uh, comes out in a 1958 uh, court decision, Cooper v. Aaron, where the court says we are actually final. Uh, but in response to that, you know, many people say, well, wait a minute, you're not final. The executive has a constitutional duty to uphold the Constitution. The Congress has a constitutional duty to uphold the Constitution. Why do we prefer one body's view over another? Not only that, there's a large body of scholarship now saying that it's actually we, the people, that are the ultimate guarantor of the Constitution, not the Supreme Court. After all, why do people obey the Supreme Court? Um, it's not because of, you know, they were appointed by God. It's because they're embedded in a democratic system. So that suggests that even at the national level, uh, it's not clear that one body really is final. Now, it's been very good uh, in recent years to, to see the development of constitutional courts around the world. I think that's been a generally stabilizing, um, except in Brazil last week. Uh, uh, and uh, what happened in Brazil last week is that the, the court decided to enjoin the legislature from deciding a particular issue. They were discussing an issue that was just a proposed bill. The court enjoined them from passing it. Well, the legislature wasn't very happy about that, and it seems to be a kind of excess of jurisdiction. And now they're proposing to limit the court. Well, you know, that's, okay, that's an example of a court overreaching, and that's the fundamental challenge of the era of juristocracy that we're living in, where courts have become so much more important. Uh, so we shouldn't assume that courts are always right, and therefore it might be possible for international courts to check lower ones in ways that are actually helpful for democracy. The legislative body can always change the constitution, but as I mean, as long as it's written in the constitution, I guess the Supreme Court will have to track what's written there, just to avoid tendencies. 
Yes, no, I agree with that. Yeah. I was wondering if maybe you could describe and compare a bit while being the International Criminal Tribunal, just what, what the, court, the Constitutional Court would look like, how it might be similar or different to the International Criminal yeah, so um, I, I wasn't at all involved in this, but there was a, there's a kind of a group of folks who've drafted a mechanism for appointing these judges. Uh, and the challenge, of course, for all international courts is how to get people who are, you know, have the support of states it, but are not you know, just partisans, right? Are not simply partisans. There's a lot of very good literature, by the way, on trying to um, determine whether international judges are in fact neutral or biased. Are they biased towards their home state or are they biased towards states like them? And it's just a very interesting literature. It seems to be in some cases you could find bias, just as you would in the U.S. Supreme Court by who appointed the judge. Um, so those kind of dynamics do, do, do play out. The proposal is to have um, the judges of several important international courts, the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, I think the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea, I'm not sure, um, get together and nominate a large group of potential judges. Uh, double the number that are needed, and then have the General Assembly of the United Nations elect the judges. Um, that's somewhat similar to the way the International Court of Justice uh, ju justices are appointed, um, that they are as well elected by the General Assembly. So that's, good, that's the idea of s trying to solve the problem of insulation, but also some kind of deep representation and accountability for the judges. Um, it's a little bit premature, in my view, to be talking about this, because who even knows if a treaty is going to be the right form, if the UN will be involved. But it, that's, the, that's the proposal. Can we take one more question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we may have already covered this because we talked about jurisdiction a little bit, and it might be too early to tell me this hasn't been talked about yet. But you compared it to the ICC a lot, and I'm wondering if you see this court as having the same Right. Uh, right. So who would be able to bring cases to the court? Now, with the International uh, Criminal Court, it's basically states and, you know, UN, the UN body, uh, and the prosecutor can take some cases with approval of the Security Council. What is contemplated here is something much more open than that, something that would include um, even the possibility of individuals or NGOs and such bringing cases um, once they have exhausted local remedies, once they've gone through the entire system. And again, that has some of the costs and benefits that have come out in the discussion today. Uh, on the one hand, you don't, want, uh, yet an, you don't want everything to be appealed to this international level, but for extreme violations might make some sense. Um, uh, and you also, of course, want to have some screen because the court's going to have very limited capacity, so an exhaustion of remedies requirement seems to, seems to accomplish that. Um, I don't think that there is any notion that we, as such as that we find in the International Criminal Court, which is that states can be brought before the International Criminal Court, or people can be brought for, before the International Criminal Court, even if their own government didn't agree to, their, to the jurisdiction. I don't think that's contemplated. This is going to be, in some sense, a more traditional body in that uh, you know, states will either buy in or will not. I don't imagine they'll be adjudicating cases from North Korea very soon. Well, thank you very much for your attention. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you.